and the right hand was cut off. This is the back of the head of a young girl in Nigeria from the Igbo tribe who remembered the life of a man who had had brain surgery for an intracranial tumor. And she was born with this remarkable scar in the back of her head. Again, these birthmarks, these birth defects, make no sense in terms of what we know of embryological development. Paul von Ward, who is not associated with our group, claims to, to have found amazing similarities in the facial geometry of people who remember a past life and the person they claim to have been in the past life. And he's matched up photographs of the present person and the past life person. And he's developed six biometric ratios that he claims are more similar in these matched pairs than with control subjects. The difficulty with Von Ward's data is that these measurements were not done blindly. Von Ward himself made the measurements on the subjects and on the photos of the deceased persons. So what we would like to do is try to replicate his findings in a blind manner. That is, have one person make the measurements on the subject, have a different person make the measurements on photos of the deceased person, and then a third person who doesn't know which is which, see if they can match up the correct person with the deceased. One of the problems we're going to have, though, is we have a very limited sample of photographs of the deceased person. Most of these are in remote areas in underdeveloped countries, but we do have some. The second hypothesis about survival is that people who are now deceased are still surviving in some form. And we have lots of evidence that contributes to this hypothesis. Most commonly are interactive apparitions. And these are, I'm not talking about ghosts in haunted houses that just wander through and don't talk to you. I'm talking about visions, apparitions, that interact and respond meaningfully with you. These often occur around the time of the death of the person who's dead. And they will communicate meaningful things to the person who's having the vision. There have been some attempts in recent years to try to induce these communications with interactive visions. Raymond Moody, who coined the term near-death experience, developed what he called the psychomantium, which is essentially a uh, sensory deprivation room in which after an elaborate ritual, people will go into this room and try to invoke a vision of the deceased. And in some cases, with some good facilitators, people do have these interactive visions. There's a psychologist in the VA system named Al Botkin, who was using EMDR to treat uh, veterans with post-traumatic stress. And he found serendipitously that some of them, as he was doing this, would have visions of their fallen comrades that interacted with them. And this turned out to be so therapeutic for the vets that he started trying to induce it using EMDR and suggestion. And in fact, has claimed a fair amount of success in getting them to induce these visions which are interactive and communicate in two ways. Then we have communication through mediums. And you've heard this excellent presentation from Julie. I won't repeat what she said. I will tell you, though, that our lab, Emily Kelly in our division, has replicated this work with slightly different technology and found equally impressive results. This has been done, as you know, by Gary Schwartz's lab, by our lab, um, uh, by a group in Scotland, Archie Roy and Tricia Ritchie. Um, so it's been replicated in several places now in the last couple of decades. Julie told you about the elaborate controls we try to put in to make sure that the medium isn't getting sensory cues from the sitter or using super psi from the sitter. There's another type of data from mediumship sittings that eliminates that possibility. And that's what's called a drop-in communicator. These are allegedly deceased people who come to a mediumship session, a seance, and no one in the room, neither the medium nor the sitters, knows this person. These are unusual. They provide great evidence because you can't get the information by normal means, but they're rare. 
However, Ian Stevenson found more than 60, 60 of these in the published literature. Let me give you an example. In a small village of about 5,000 people in Tuscany, there was a day laborer who in his 20s developed mediumship abilities. And he used to give seances. He didn't charge for them. 10 local villagers would come. One of them would take verb verbatim notes. And he would have these seances periodically. And at one point, a communicator appeared at one of these seances and said his name was Giuseppe Riccardi. And he was a Roman Catholic priest in Canton, Ohio. No one in the room knew of this fellow. He said that he had been shot with a revolver by one of his parishioners after he had completed mass. Father Riccardi appeared in a couple of more seances over the period of the next couple of years. In all the times he appeared, no one in the room had ever heard of Father Riccardi. At one of these seances, there was an Italian researcher present who wrote to Ian Stevenson and said, this guy says he lived in Ohio. Can you track down whether he really did? Well, we didn't have a date of death, so it wasn't easy. But one of our research assistants contacted the archdiocese in Youngstown, Ohio, and confirmed that there was a Giuseppe Riccardi, who had been the parish priest in Canton, Ohio, for four years before he was shot by a parishioner. He had just finished mass, everyone left, and one woman came in, pointed a gun at him, and said a few words, and then shot him. He lived long enough to ask her, uh, why did you do this? And by what he said to the medium, she gave an answer that he didn't understand. Now that we had the date of death from the archdiocese, he went to the newspapers, and we found reports in several Ohio newspapers about this, confirming the details of it. So everything that the medium came up with in Italy turned out to be true. We then contacted the researcher in Italy and said, now here's the date at which this happened. Go back and check the Italian newspapers. No account had appeared in the newspapers that were circulating in this small village in Tuscany. They eventually found one report in a newspaper in Rome that did report the death of Father Giuseppe Riccardi. And the newspaper account placed it in Canton, China, <laughs> which is about 20 times the size of Canton, Ohio, so it's a logical mistake. So it's unlikely that this medium had gotten the information by any normal means. One other way you might be able to differentiate super psi from survival is by evidence of strong motivation on the part of the deceased, the discarnate, to communicate. And there's another remarkable drop-in communicator that Ian and Erlander Haraldson from Iceland studied. They were doing studies of the professional Icelandic medium, um, Hafstein Bjornsson. And at one of Bjornsson's uh, seances, a character appeared and said that he had been buried without his leg that had been dismembered shortly before death. And he wanted the leg buried with the body. No one in the room knew what he was talking about. No one recognized the story. This discarnate, this alleged discarnate, reappeared many times in different Hofstein Bjornsson seances with different sitters present, and none of them ever recognized the story. But eventually, he gave enough detail that they were able to find the leg and bury it in the anonymous graveyard in the church that he claimed was his. After that happened, he never appeared again. That suggests some motivation on the part of some entity that is no longer with us. Okay, we also have evidence from instrumental transcommunication, what used to be called electronic voice phenomena. These are situations in which an alleged discarnate seems to be communicating through some mechanical device now it's usually electromagnetic, like a telephone, or a television, or a radio, or a computer. One of the difficulties with this research is that the signals usually come through on top of white noise. And there are some subjective